Rim Country Forum today being brought to you by the Dana Law Group, Sunshine Cleaning and Restoration, Hospitality Wireless, Dan Good Flooring, Anytime Fitness, Choice Auto and Truck, and Holiday Cruises and Tours. Well, good Monday morning. It's five minutes past nine o'clock, 67 degrees, looking for that high today of 80. And more on today's Rim Country weather forecast coming up in just a little bit. Did you say Shifting moron? I didn't. I wasn't talking about any moron in particular. Just more on that story. Um, anyway, with us in the studio this morning. Now we're talking about uh, the Grand Opportunity Party once again, and as we do uh, once a month, we have Gary Morris, the chairman of the Gila County Republican Party, with us, and also Andy McKinney, the first vice chairman of the Gila County Republican Party. And how are you both doing? A swell. Thanks, Randy. Swell. I like yeah, that. It's it's a beautiful, beautiful spring day it, for summer. It is. Plus, uh, we got rain at my house last night. Yeah, and actually mm -hmm. all the way down to Tonto Basin, just a little bit, enough to hopefully wash some of the pollen down. Um, <laughs> and my nose is feeling better just thinking about that. Well, we have a lot of stuff to cover in uh, the next hour. I know that we're going to be talking with uh, uh, State Senator Sylvia Allen, and we have a number of different things. But um, to begin with, uh, I guess uh, I, we probably should talk about some of the announcements that I know you want to make here. Oh, well. sure. Now, uh, again, we do a fundraising uh, luncheon or dinner t uh, twice a, a year, and uh, the COVID-19 uh, events uh, canceled or rescheduled our uh, March uh, big event. So that's going to be rescheduled uh, probably in late July or early August. Uh, you can go to helagop.com to monitor that. Uh, those persons that purchased tickets for the original uh, event, uh, we're carrying those forward. Uh, to the July or August event. Currently, uh, Congressman Gosar has confirmed uh, we're speaking with uh, McSally's office, uh, and I may have a nice surprise guest that would be very interesting uh, as part of that, uh, the three speakers. So it's a great time uh, for folks to come down and uh, meet and greet uh, their elected officials and ask questions of uh, Gosar and McSally and, and the other guests. Uh, so uh, watch for that. Yeah. And Randy, it really is uh, wonderful to live in a country where you can uh, meet your, uh, your elected officials, especially at the high level of the officials that are uh, come to our, uh, our Lincoln Day and our Reagan Day dinners. And you can, you can just talk to them. I right. mean, they're just, uh, they put their pants on one, one leg at a time, just like the rest of us. Yeah, and the other is we've opened our headquarters. Uh, to uh, voter registration, and that facility is located at 434 South Beeline Highway, west side, just behind the ER, a uh, realty. Uh, so we're registering uh, voters. There's precautionary measures uh, that have taken place. Uh, we'd like you to come with your face covering. Uh, but uh, Saturday, we registered uh, eight people during the day on a Saturday. Uh, we're open on weekdays uh, to do that too, and one of those on Saturday changed to its uh, registration from Democrat to Republican. We always like to see that. You know, some of the I, I was looking over some of the numbers uh, that you all have shared, and uh, now you're you're now 61 percent ahead of Democrats, and that's a 76 percent turnaround. That's that's astounding. Yeah, it's never been done in the state of Arizona for any county. Wow, we're the we're the hottest county uh, in the state, and for phone calls and making contact with potential voters. We're the hottest county in the entire country. Wow. One, one of our ladies in, in just last month placed more than 10,000 calls to potential voters. Really? Really? Boy, I mean, talk about being busy, huh? Yeah. yeah. Wow. We're hot. Nothing wrong with and that. The, the, the last uh, citizen that I, I registered was an 82-year-old fella who was an immigrant. Wow. How yeah. neat is that? Yeah. 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 Uh, that was, was really cool. Yeah. Very nice. Well, I know we want to talk about uh, uh, some of uh, President Trump's uh, recent successes and everything, and we're going to get to that, but right now we do have with us on the phone line uh, Arizona Senator Sylvia Allen. And uh, Senator Allen, uh, welcome back to Rim Country Forum again. Good morning, Sylvia. Good morning. Well, you know, uh, uh, Senator Allen, uh, Friday's uh, Roundup newspaper had an article on your win in court over a challenge that uh, many of your re-election petition signatures were invalid. Tell us about that challenge a little. Yes, well, first off, I was so surprised because I had over 956 signatures, which I only need 488. So normally, you just never challenge 
uh, petitions that have, you know, double what they need. Uh, because it is true that sometimes people will sign your petition that, you know, belong to the wrong party or are not really registered to vote and uh, moved and had re-registered or whatever it is. And so you usually have a percentage, and so you want to always get a higher number, which I did. So I was really, really surprised, and I've never had my petitions challenged before because I always make an effort to get as many as I possibly can. And by the way, I really appreciate everybody that did sign my petition, and especially the volunteers that worked so hard to help you get these signatures. It's a very daunting task every election. But that being said, I was able to, uh, you know, be able to withstand the challenge, and uh, I was able to prevail in court. And it was just my opponent, uh, she was able to find somebody who supported her that was willing to be the name on the lawsuit. And I think it was just designed, uh, she threw down the first gauntlet of how this, elect this uh, campaign is going to go, and uh, she's going to, you know, work very hard to try to defeat me, but uh, I'm going to push back just as hard. Sylvia, if there was a cost involved, would you like to share that with the audience? Well, yes, and that was another thing I think it was designed to do was to make me spend money on, uh, I haven't got the total bill yet, it would probably be around six to $7,000. Oh, my sure. word. And, and so, you know, if you spend money on uh, that instead of, you know, getting out there and getting your message to the voter, well, then that was the tactic which my opponent used. Interesting. A lot of money. Uh, let me point out that she's a very good a career candidate. She she knows how to run and she works hard. And she uh, back in 2016 was a bundler for the Jeb Bush campaign, and so she built up a network of donors all across this country. And as she's made her run for Congress, which she's done that four times now, uh, this will be the total of five times that she's ran. Um, she has been able to build up a network of donors across the country. Uh, that uh, have supported her runs to Congress, and I don't know if they were really clear what she was running for this time or not, but uh, she's been able to raise quite a bit of money. You know, you know we're talking about uh, your challenger, uh, Wendy Rogers, uh, uh, is a Republican challenger in the primary. And what, one question I have for you, Senator Allen, is the word that I've been hearing is that Rogers doesn't even live in the district. What's up with that? Yes, thank you for bringing that up. Absolutely very clear. <coughs> On her petition, she used an address in Flagstaff, which is a 12-foot wide vacation trailer uh, in a mobile home park, and that is what she used as her residency. The Arizona Constitution is very clear. It says that you need to be the residence of the county from which you run for at least one year. And uh, she lives in Tempe, where she's been since 1996 in a 3,000 square foot home, very lovely home, one mile from where their uh, business is located, which they've also had since 96, and uh, a few miles from Falcon, uh, Mesa Falcon Air, Airport, where her plane is, is uh, located. And um, so definitely that's where she has her residency. And interestingly, when she voted this last time, she ran for CD1, and, and Congress does not require residency. She ran up here twice now for CD1, for CD1. And when she asked for her mail, her mail-in ballot so she could vote in the election, she had it mailed to her home in Tempe, and that's where she voted. And here's my problem, besides the fact I don't think that's very honest with the voters. We have very few rural legislators. We fight tooth and nail for rural issues at the state legislature because we're outnumbered by the large population counties. And all the money tends to go there. Uh, they don't really understand or care about rural issues. And, and I don't think that District 6 needs to elect another Maricopa County legislator because that's where she lives. That's where she'll go home every night and on the weekends. And uh, she's not tuned in. She's very adept at federal issues because she's ran so often on those issues. But on the rural issues, she's not that well informed. Now, you mentioned that she's run for uh, a number of uh, offices in the past. Has she ever won any elections? No, she has not. This will be her sixth time, and she's lost every time. Well, that means that she really doesn't have any legislative experience then. No, she does not have any uh, elected experience in any any uh, office that I'm aware of, but definitely not in the legislature. 
And again, we, we've just got to have uh, people ready to hit the ground running when it comes to the Sandar rural issues. And when we get into other discussions, I will, I will make that point over and over about the difference of, of rural legislators on how we have to fight for our issues up here and getting our fair share of the money. You know, I'm curious, while we have you on the line here, I know a little later in the show we're going to be talking about constitutional tyrants, uh, you know, mostly governors in blue states. Uh, but what's your view on balancing constitutional rights during an emergency such as the, the current pandemic? Thank you so much for bringing this up. You know, I, I, I posted again on my Facebook uh, an article that was written about the pandemic we had in 1968-69. Uh, and it was the Hong Kong flu. It was an H3N2 virus. And it was a very deadly virus. And we didn't do any of these things that we are doing now with this, this uh, COVID. And, and there were more deaths caused from that particular virus then than there is now. And then you move forward about every 10 years, we have an ugly virus that shows up during the flu season. And not one time have we implemented these kinds of restrictions and this kind of martial law through any of those pandemics. And I asked Dr. Chris, who's over the health department, I also have to sit on the health committee at the Senate, and we had two uh, updates before we, had, we were run out of the legislature because of this virus. And I asked her both times, why are you treating this particular virus different? Why are we doing these type of measures this time when we never did it through any other virus? And she never gave me an answer. She could not give me an answer. And I have come to the conclusion that this virus is different because we've, we've made it political. And let me add to, to that. She mentioned the Hong Kong virus uh, in 68-69. It killed over 100,000 people. Uh, and 60 million plus were uh, affected, and the country trucked along uh, without any breaks. And, and those 100,000 people also included infants and children. I mean, it, it ravaged all ages of the population. It wasn't just focused. But, uh, this virus is a little different, and it seems to only be very dangerous for those with compromised immune systems and the elderly. And uh, now that we, another complaint that I have is the show is being run by healthcare bureaucrats. The bureaucrats in the CDC, the bureaucrats in Washington, the bureaucrats in Arizona. These, these individuals are wonderful individuals, I'm not saying that, but they are not visuals that have been out on the ground fighting, having, uh, 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 you know, treating patients and uh, being involved on the ground in the medical community where I think those individuals know very well what works and what doesn't work in, in certain situations. And, and yet we're taking our call from them. And, and I believe also the media played a big part in this. Because we wanted it to be political and go after President Trump, uh, and also because of, you know, the, the deep state or whatever you want to call it, these, these, these bureaucrats and people in agencies and in powerful positions that make the decisions and determinations, they saw an opportunity. And by darn, you can't believe the money that is being spent and, and, and where it's going. And I want to talk about this money. I want to bring up some figures about it. But before we get to that, I just want to say um, that the media fueled the fear and people became very afraid. And I am not, I am not going to ba uh, bash uh, Governor Ducey. He was going on the best information he had. The whole nation became very fearful and starting with the federal government starting you know, down, uh, these restrictions started. But what I do want to say now is that now that we're into it and we see really what's going on and we see the damage that's being done not only economically but with our constitutional rights, then we need to stop and, and start looking at this very carefully and start, a, and start getting out of this and going back to handling this in the way that we have done in the past where we haven't caused this kind of damage. Well, and you also uh, mentioned, uh, mentioned uh, funding. I know Senator Fan. Uh, issued a memo regarding federal funding to uh, states fighting COVID-19. How are these funds supposed to be used? Okay, so let me let me give you some figures. From the CRS report, $2.8 billion is coming into Arizona. And out of that, $965 million is being distributed to Maricopa County because they're distributing it based on uh, areas where the, the population is 500000 and above. So. 
stop and think about that. So where's the money going? It's going from Pinal, uh, uh, Pima, Pinal, and Maricopa is where those, the, a lot of this money's going. It's coming out, uh, out $174 per, per resident in those areas. So now the rural legislators, we're starting to speak up and we're trying to say, all right, where, where is some of this money coming to rural Arizona? How are you going to distribute it to us? Uh, are we going to get some of this money? Better question is, what are we using this money for? Who is using this money? For what? Where's the accountability and the transparency? Because, gentlemen, you, the taxpayer, are going to have to pay this back. We are going to have to pay this back through the debt that we've accumulated and through inflation. And so we, the people, have got to know, what are you doing with this money? And is it being fairly distributed? And the rural legislators, we are speaking up very strong, trying to find that. And Senator Fan is setting up a task force committees. I'm going to be on some of them. And we're going to look at all aspects of this. Where this money is going, we're going to look at the education dollars, which I'll mention here in a minute. And we're also looking at um, the constitutionality of, of uh, the statutes that the governor had used. Is that really gave them that broad of a power? Do we need to put things to, uh, in uh, be ready with legislation so we don't have a replay of this next winter? Because the Democrat side is saying, oh no, we're going to keep these restrictions in place all the way around till next year. Uh, they, they really want to keep the fear going and they want to keep this political. You know, you mentioned uh, education. You're the chairwoman of the Senate Education Committee. Uh, when do you think schools will be able to resume? Well, I don't know. Let me let me ban a minute. I I really felt like we should at least allow our high school seniors to have a graduation and, and do that at the very end of May. You know, the first of June school, uh, but with local control and flexibility, figure out how they would like to have a graduation ceremony for uh, the seniors. Well. In my own community, because none of these restrictions have been lessened yet, I have a grandson graduating, and I am so proud of him, Austin. He has autism, and he's graduating high school, and we wanted to celebrate. And so what they got lined up is uh, they're going to allow the seniors to come down to the, the gym. Only four, four guests can come with them. Only four. That means I will not get to go, because that means only his immediate family will get to go. And, and he's the only, they're the only ones in the gym. He walks across, they video it, he gets his diploma, and they walk out the other door. Wow. And yeah, I'm upset about that. So at any rate, um, right now, uh, school will, you know, they're not opening school at all for anything, and we're going to go into the summer. And um, so let's talk about the money for the schools. At, Education federal dollars is $632 million of coming to Arizona for education. And um, $67 million of that the governor is going to be able to use for discretionary dollars. And uh, about $230 million of that is going to uh, universities and community colleges. And then the rest of that goes to K-12. So I am working with the uh, uh, state superintendent, Hoffman, and um, again, I want transparency and accountability of where those dollars are going, what are they being spent on, how are we going to use them. There is uh, very flexible. They can be used for tutoring. They can be used for uh, mental health counseling. They can be used for uh, um, uh, oh, dropout rates. That's another thing. Our high, school our high school students have lost a big part of the year are the kids that were in Algebra Run ready to go to Algebra 2? I mean, we have a lot of questions to ask. What is this going to mean for education going forward? And how are we going to help our kids get caught up? Are we going to do summer school? Well, you know, I, I know that we're just about out of time for this segment, but one of the things that um, I think uh, uh, I, a lot of people have concerns on a variety of levels about is, uh, you know, recently, as you mentioned, uh, uh, they, they sent the legislature home. Um, do you have any idea who can call the return of the legislature? And, and do you believe the legislature is going to be called back into work this year? Well, on, on Friday, we met at the Senate, and they, uh, they we voted to sign a guy, which means that we ended the Senate session. However, I voted no. I was one of the six senators that voted no, not to sign a guy. The main reason, there's a lot of reasons, but one is the House was not in session. The House is not wanting to sign a die. 
Therefore, the statutes require that if the house does not answer by signing die themselves within 72 hours, then the, then we're still in, then our, we have to remain in session. So uh, we're basically, tomorrow will be the deadline on the house responding to us, and we'll see what happens. But I predict we'll be going back. Um, the, uh, we were wanting to, to pass legislation, I did, and other senators, to take away the uh, penalties on businesses. Uh, I wish I had time to, to read about the uh, executive order that's very confusing. I have a restaurant up here in Heber Overgard, and we asked them, are you going to be opening up? And they said no. We, they said, you know, the health department regulations are very black and white, and very clear cut, and we know where we are and how we have to operate. But the governor's executive order is so confusing and so convoluted. I can't say. Con convoluted. Yeah, thank you. That it gives law enforcement wide ability to come in and and uh, ticket us, and and we don't have any clear direction, so we're not opening until we are back into the the regular regulations. And so that's that's what we were trying to do. We were trying to take away some of that confusion, take away the ability of law enforcement to do uh, to ticket them, and also take away liability. Uh, I've given them some liability immunity, not not if they were very gross, grossly negligent, negligent, but to give some liability for church, protection for churches and nonprofits and people who are out there, because you know individuals want to say, hey, I'm going to blame you for why I got sick, and instead of taking personal responsibility. So we wanted to try to fix that, but we didn't have the votes, and so we weren't able to do that. So. We're, we're working hard, but it is very complicated and, and there's so many serious things to have to look at that but we're not going to stop working. I'm going to keep working hard. And before I get off, I just want you to know how much that I appreciate uh, Representative Blackman, who I work with. He has been a wonderful representative. I support Brenda Barton, and I hope we can get her reelected. And I'm very uh, thankful to Congressman Gosar, who has come out publicly and endorsed me. Always a pleasure to have you on. We have to take a break and uh, switch gears here. But uh, Senator Allen, keep up the good work and keep us posted, if you would. Thank you so much. Goodbye, guys. Have a good day. Bye, right. right, Sylvia. Bye, Sylvia. Thank you very much. Again, we do have to take a fast break. We'll be right back with more right after these words. Don't go away. Country Forum, 30 minutes past the hour right now, 68 degrees. Again, looking for that high today of only 80. A little bit of a cooler week in store for you. We'll tell you about that seven-day forecast coming up in just a little bit. And if you just tuned in this morning, uh, we are uh, uh, once again talking with uh, uh, the chairman of the Gila County Republican Party, Gary Morris, also uh, Vice Chairman uh, Andy McKinney in the studio with us. And, and uh, switching back to conversations here amongst us, you know, obviously everybody's talking about all kinds of different uh, flavors of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so collectively, what do you think we've learned so far from this whole thing? Well, there's, there needs to be a, a large national, probably international critique over this, but for uh, the United States, the, the major uh, lesson learned, I believe, is uh, the U.S. privately run health care system is the best in the world. And if you take a look at uh, government run uh, health care around the, the world that collapsed uh, over the COVID-19 crisis. Italy. Today, Italy. Mm -hmm. Uh, m much of Europe, et cetera. We're, we're now shipping leftover ventilators to these countries, uh, and the death rates are, are higher. So uh, I want the listeners to understand that when the Democrats are talking about uh, single-payer, government-run health care, Medicare for everybody, that's the kind of system, a collapsing system, that will occur during a pandemic that you see elsewhere. We need to keep our private health care. The other is, uh, we can't repeat, uh, Sylvia described uh, the problems that we're going through, we can't repeat this uh, again, uh, and it seems that uh, the, the major question in the critique is, we're seeing a pandemic every decade or so, uh, can this country continue to do every 10 years what we did this time and still survive as a country? There's financial complications and heavy debt and all that kind of stuff. We've never done this level of shutdown in, in the past. Hmm. Um, so if you take a look at Japan, a very densely populated country, uh, has a very low death rate. And what they did at the earliest outset 
uh, started mandating face coverings, for example, uh, frequent washing uh, of your hands, uh, social distancing where it can be practiced, etc. cetera, uh, isolating the vulnerable, primarily anybody over 60 years of age. So the lesson I believe will occur is that the next time the earliest indications of a major outbreak or pandemic we initiate these basic uh, health care procedures and that will substantially reduce the infection rate. You know, you, you mentioned that uh, some of these more socialist focused uh, countries uh, seem to be struggling more with this than others. Um, what about, you know, here in the United States, uh, are you at a greater risk of dying of uh, COVID-19 in uh, Democrat blue states than you are in uh, red Republican states? Very interesting study. Yeah, and this is, this is shocking and and very sad. Uh, uh, American Spectator uh, had a report that if you live in New Jersey, you're 13 times more likely to die from COVID-19 than if you live in Florida. And this and, is a Democrat governor who stated on TV he didn't consider the U.S. Constitution when he shut down, shut down the state. Oof. Yeah, um, and uh, everybody knows that uh, uh, Florida is uh, chock full of old people. Uh, so it, it's it's not that uh, the death rate in the uh, uh, in New Jersey per million is 895 deaths per million. Uh, in Florida, 65. Well, that's a big difference. Uh, it's, that that is just enormous, enormous <coughs> difference. Um, <clears throat> what, obviously, there, the people in Florida are, are doing things that they're not doing or certainly didn't do uh, early enough uh, in, uh, in New Jersey. Uh, we have 26 red states. Uh, the average uh, coronavirus death, per, death rate per million is 82. In the 24 blue states, plus the District of Columbia, my birthplace, by the way, mm. uh, is 235. That is the red state death rate 82, the blue state death rates 235. Pretty stark contrast. It's, a, it's an enormous contrast. Um, on the average, you're about to, uh, almost three times more likely to die of COVID-19 if you live in a, uh, a state run by Democrats than if you live in a state that are wisely and um, uh, humanely uh, run, run by uh, Republicans. If you live in New York, your chance of dying of uh, coronavirus is 11 times higher if you live in Georgia. And if, if you remember, uh, early on, uh, uh, President Trump uh, turned off the uh, airplane flights between uh, uh, New York and Europe. Mm -hmm. And the governor of New York had a fit. He wanted those airplane flights to continue. Uh, that's one of the reasons why New York's in such a big fat mess. Seems like uh, Trump was taking a bunch of heat to begin with for doing that, that uh, we don't need to do it, and then uh, a little bit later on he's taking heat because he didn't do more. Um, the guy can't win. Well, that, that uh, describes the, the whole situation. Uh, Senator Allen described the, the fear generated by the media and the Democrats have mm. driven uh, decisions that in calmer times probably wouldn't have been made and uh, the public would have been uh, better protected. Uh, Florida, for example, they immediately focused on the vulnerable and really shut down all of the nursing homes and elderly uh, occupancies. And, yeah, and, and they, they did not do so in New York. And the, the governor of New York even ordered uh, COVID-19 patients that's got the disease to be delivered to a, a retirement home uh, for care. So, wow. Yeah. Well, that's almost <laughs> criminal. Yeah, uh, five five thousand uh, uh, deaths in uh, retirement homes in New York State. Wow. Well, let's shift gears. Uh, another interesting topic that's been uh, uh, in the news of late: uh, Janitor, uh, General Flynn has been exonerated. And yeah, uh, when it all looked like he was uh, just uh, you know bad news and everything, it's starting to look like maybe he got set up a little bit. Oh, he absolutely got set up, and this broke Friday. And more is coming this week because uh, the media and others are reviewing uh, hundreds of pages of testimony in correct, uh, congressional hearings where uh, the officials like CIA director and, and others 
in testimony said there was no collusion. We know it. There's nothing there. But they go on CNN and say we had direct evidence of collusion. That went on for now three years. But uh, U.S. Attorney General Barr uh, assigned a, a U.S. attorney to review uh, Flynn's case and found some very, very troubling uh, problems and recommended that the uh, DOJ drop the case. Uh, so here's what we know. Uh, FBI Director James Comey deliberately set up uh, and publicly set up Finn and publicly bragged about it. Uh, and he did so because he assumed, and almost did, he, he could get away from it. And you can remember uh, he's uh, speaking to a very large audience and they ask him, why did you send the, the folks over to the White House to interview Flynn? Uh, because I, I could get away with it. Uh, yeah, this because was he was well aware of the protocol at the White House that any interviews by any law enforcement agency has to go through the President's counsel. And they bypassed it. They set him up. Yeah. This was uh, very early in, in the uh, formative uh, uh, days of the administration. Mm -hmm. And uh, Comey said quite directly that he took advantage of the, uh, uh, the chaos. chaos that uh, inevitably happens uh, uh, at the beginning of any administration. So here's a little background. January 17, or 2017, this is immediately prior to uh, the inauguration. On January 4th, the FBI closed the file on the Flynn investigation uh, and described that there's no derogatory information found, meaning there's nothing there that can uh, be uh, used in a conviction. Uh, however, when FBI agent Peter Stroke heard this, he texted the case manager in a text said, if you haven't closed Razor, that's the code name for the investigation, if you haven't closed Razor, don't do it yet. And he immediately picked up and initiated a full-fledged invest investigative probe on Flynn. Now, DOJ guidelines uh, for opening counterintelligence probes on any high-level government official requires uh, the President of the United States to be notified. Okay, so we'll talk about President Obama here shortly. All right, we do have a caller on the line, so let's take a quick call here. 20 minutes in front of 10 o'clock. Hi, you're on Rim Country Forum. Good morning. Yes, the um, Democrats seem to be using the fact that he pled guilty to um, the because he was losing millions of dollars uh, and had to sell his house and he's pretty uh, much financially ruined, right? They, they, yeah, financially ruined him. They threatened to, to do the same to his son, who was also innocent. So uh, that happens all the time. Uh, Attorney General uh, Barr uh, described that uh, sometimes people plead guilty to something that was never a crime. That's the quote from the U.S. Attorney General, and it applies in this uh, case. All right, now we have to take a fast break, and we're going to thanks for the call, by the way. We're going to come back with more. Again, if you just tuned in, uh, talking this morning with uh, Gary Morris and Andy McKinney about the uh, Republican concerns, uh, not only here in Rim Country, but across our nation. And if you have a comment or question, we'd be happy to try and take your calls and work those in as well at 474-2427. Back with more right after this. Moo. All right. Hey, real quick, before we uh, get back on topic here, we do have one more caller on the line. We'll take this call real quick. Hi, you're on Rim Country Forum. Thanks for calling. Very very good. How are you? I'd like to get your thoughts on what, how they're going to um, right this wrong with Scott Flynn. Uh, I would hope that they would compensate him somehow to uh, make up for what he's lost. And I'm hoping and praying we will seek justice on this. I mean, it was wrong. We all knew it was wrong. Well, you know, and right along with that, uh, you know, it seems like there's an awful lot of interesting names, uh, um, you know, with the FBI, and uh, I guess, you know, you chalk up a lot of stuff to uh, the deep state, Andy, but, um, you know, I mean, do you, do you feel like, uh, you know, there's actually going to, you know, possibly some of this, the darkness in this is going to be brought out into the light for everybody to see, and maybe some uh, uh, rectification happen? Uh, I, I certainly hope so, and I expect that there will be uh, some uh, additional information uh, available later this week. Um, the, the way these people are all hooked together 
um, is, is pretty uh, pretty telling, I think. <coughs> Uh, there's one of the prosecutors for um, uh, Robert Mueller, a guy named uh, Andrew Weissman, if you remember that name. Um, his, uh, his mentor uh, in his career is, uh, oh. None other. Than the current FBI director, Christopher Wray. Coincidence, perhaps? I, uh, boy, that's hard to see the coincidence on top of coincidence on top of coincidence. Isn't it, mm. Randy? Yeah, really. Uh, uh, Christopher Ray was Weissman's supervisor uh, when they were all at the Department of Justice uh, and apparently uh, they had a reputation in, in Texas in the, the Houston office uh, where they uh, ran roughshod over, uh, over the citizens. Um, the, as a matter of fact, uh, Weissman's prosecution of Enron uh, Corporation is very, very loud, very visible, very high profile a prosecution. Uh, Weissman's tactics were so dirty that the whole thing was eventually thrown out by the Supreme Court. Wow. Uh, Ray was presiding over all of this stuff <clears throat> earlier in his career, which explains why the current FBI director, I'm, I'm sorry, why FBI director Ray failed to seriously address the corruption in the agency. He's been stonewalling uh, and withholding documents and evidence. This is uh, a part of what happened, uh, the reason that uh, uh, General Flynn was, uh, has been uh, exonerated. Uh, you can't do that. You can't legally withhold uh, documents and evidence in uh, criminal cases. And these guys did it uh, regularly. The former FBI head of counterintelligence, a guy named Bill uh, Presap, uh, after meeting with Comey and his direct, deputy director, uh, Andrew McCabe, you remember that name, right. Andrew McCabe, uh, what was our goal? That was the question. What was our goal? Uh, truth and admission, or to get him, t and get this, this is what they're setting up. Or, and, and they wrote it down, the idiots, or to get him to lie so we can prosecute him or get him fired. This may have been expressed as, uh, as an honest question over the motivation, petty damning uh, plan to railroad General Flynn. They, shame on them. I mean, this is this is this is third world uh, uh, tin pot dictator. And especially stuff. with a general of our military. I mean, that that, that just oh, they don't like care the four about stars that. too. Yeah. They don't care about that at all. Uh, Comey later publicly took credit. Um, uh, when he had a large audience, so he, he, because he said he could, he he did this because he could get away with it, sending and he says a couple of guys over to the White House, uh, bypassing the long-established protocols that mandated the FBI go through the White House counsel, specifically in order to set Flynn up. And then I'll add to another special note: fellow investigators who interviewed Flynn told superiors. <coughs> Struck and Comey, uh, they did not think that Flynn intentionally lied when he denied a discussion discussing sanctions with Russian uh, Ambassador Kislyak uh, before, this was before the original 302 interview documents were altered. They altered the documents? They altered the documents? After the fact. Oh boy. So the original documents <laughs> said he did lie and struck out a hold of the 302s and altered uh, his comments, uh, Flynn's comments, to make it look like he lied. And we have the documents now. So you really think we're going to finally see some heads roll in this? I mean, because it seems to me like, I don't know, and maybe I'm misinterpreting the, uh, the definition of, uh, uh, you know, someone that, well, you know, we used to hang people. Uh, for doing this kind of thing, and I, I'm of the mind that we need to do it again and do it publicly just to get people to maybe keep their nose a little clear. Well, a lot of people would call this treason. Yeah. Absolute treason, uh, and, and at minimum a soft coup trying to remove an elected, uh, duly elected President of the United States uh, and with no uh, criminal basis at all. Yes, I think a lot of people are going to uh, roll, and it's, uh, well, some of them are quite visible. Uh, uh, Brennan, uh, Clapper, uh, Stroke, Comey, McCabe, 
there's there's probably a dozen or two out there that are going to face some kind of charges. Some will plead out. Some will get minor uh, convictions. But there's going to be some heavy do coming uh, from the attorney general. What about that uh, that one caller's question as far as uh, uh, the general? I mean, uh, do you think there's going to be a way for him to actually recoup all this money that he's lost trying to defend himself and, and deal with all this nonsense? His legal bills currently are $4.6 million. Holy moly. And had an opt done for a good uh, GoFund uh, donations, uh, uh, <laughs> That's four point six million dollars. What about you? Yeah, I don't have that in my wallet. I'm certainly not an attorney, but when the government intentionally alters records to make it look like you're guilty, uh, there's going to be a big payout to the, uh, General Flynn. Yeah. His and, attorney and wait, says they are absolutely considering the lawsuit and withholding uh, other evidence. Uh, what the, the lawyers call exculpatory or uh, evidence, wow. and they're not supposed to do that either, and, and they did it. Hmm. Well, interesting. So, uh, one of the big questions that I think a lot of people have as it pertains to all of this is, uh, what did President Obama know about all of this? Because oh, um, there's some people that are saying that this yeah. was all the way back to him. Oh, well, there's some pretty strong indicators here, uh, and as, as I described earlier, folks, Key level folks were uh, interviewed under uh, congressional hearings run by none other than Shifty Shift, uh, who told uh, investigators in Congress that no, there was nothing going on here. Mm -hmm. There was no collusion, uh, no, uh, Flynn's not guilty, this and that. And yet they're out on CNN and, and MSNBC saying we have direct evidence that they are uh, colluding and so on and so forth. And so, Mr. Chairman, in some cases, uh, they came directly out of a closed uh, secret hearing, got evidence that uh, was uh, uh, saying that uh, uh, Flynn is innocent of any wrongdoing whatsoever, and then came out and said exactly yeah. the opposite of that to the public. Well, uh, President Obama, well, first of all, it is protocol, well-practiced and established protocol, when uh, any investigative uh, agency of the government starts an intelligence investigation of a high-level official, uh, the president is notified. So that, that's the first thing that says the president had some notice of what was going on, okay? Got to remember, all these people were working in Obama's administration when all this got started back in early 2016, in the middle of the campaign, etc. Uh, so he's responsible, but stops here, uh, for everything that happened with the FBI and elsewhere. In September of 2016, and that's before the election, uh, FBI attorney Page worked, that's the girlfriend of Stroke, oh, right. uh, sent a to uh, text that says, uh, POTUS wants to know everything we're doing. And that's pretty damning to, to the president. Of course, POTUS being president of the United yeah. States. POTUS being the president of the United States. Huh. In a January 2015 meeting just prior to the inauguration, Obama warned Trump about two things that concerned him, North Korea and General Flynn. Now I can understand why Obama is concerned about North Korea and Trump needs to be prepared for that, but he already knew about General Flynn and what was going on with General Flynn or he wouldn't have warned the president, the incoming president. That's pretty damning. Uh, Obama also knew in the meeting, other officials uh, are now admitting to, Obama knew details of the wiretap Flynn uh, phone calls. Other officials that were in the meeting with Obama have uh, noted this and, and uh, told it others, which indicated that Obama had intimate details of the investigation. That's fascinating. So that it's going to be quite fascinating. Uh, and never before in the history that I'm aware of have we ever filed charges on a previous president for actions within his office. 
But this really is a kind of an attempted coup. I mean, it's, uh, you know, a lot of people, you know, there's been rumors about that, but more and more it looks like this, this is really what yeah. was happening. And in addition to potential convictions, uh, when these officials are stating in congressional testimony that there's nothing there, Flynn didn't lie, that sort of thing, and then goes out and intentionally lies about it on national media, that's a pretty strong case, I believe, uh, for uh, lawsuits uh, for libel. Yeah. I mean, we're on a lot of people's lives, not just the uh, Flynn. Curious to get your, your input. Uh, you know, we, we talk about uh, how uh, a lot of different information here was leaked to the mainstream media, especially the left-leaning, which much of the mainstream media is. Um, do you think that there, uh, there's a, a, a possibility of them being held accountable for this, or are they going to be able to hide behind, well, this is just the information that we got from them, it's all their fault? Or? Well, because they're taking information from a party that knew that he was lying, I'm not sure there's a strong case for the media, but it's pretty damning to the media that they absolutely illustrate their bias. And let me uh, direct this to Democrats out there. Uh, we've described the blue state uh, problem with the epidemic and the lack of proper response from Democrats and, and all this uh, with Lynn and Obama got started in a Democrat Obama uh, administration. Why in the world would you continue to vote for future Democrats? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> any of them at any level. All the way down to dog catcher. You, you really Every voter should really consider that as to uh, which party is going to do the best good for the public. And that's going to be the Republican Party, and it's been well demonstrated that we do that. Almost out of time. Enough time for one more quick call. Hi, you're on Rim Country Forum. Good morning. Oh, well, good morning. I'm a uh, staunch Republican here in town. I know Gary and um, <coughs> that other guy. <laughs> I, I don't know why I do it, but I get to Arizona Republic every morning. And since the papers came out the other day, Arizona Republic has not mentioned one word about anything. And for this, they are all over the collusion, or the Trump collusion, supposedly. Yeah, kind of fascinating how that works, right? Yeah, again, it shows their bias and the, the loss of true journalism in this country. All right, we've got about a minute and a half left, enough time to talk about, uh, you know, we've been talking about some of the negatives. How about some of President Trump's successes, uh, just, uh, you know, since, uh, well, he, he's coming to the close of his, uh, uh, at least hopefully in some people's minds, the end of his first administration. Yeah, well, uh, one of the things that uh, comes to mind right away is uh, the number of federal judges uh, he's been able to put on the bench. There are, as we speak this morning here, Monday morning, uh, there are 193 federal judges sitting on the bench this morning that have been uh, put there by uh, President Trump, including a couple uh, just last week. And uh, they, uh, the Democrats were just uh, hissing mad because the uh, Republicans in the Senate had the temerity to uh, actually do their job and uh, approve uh, federal judges. Uh, there. So there's that. Uh, the uh, pre the uh, Supreme Court uh, had a, handed a victory to Trump on asylum restrictions. Um, the, if you remember, the uh, asylum seekers would show up at the border and say, I'm uh, seeking asylum, and then enter the country and, and vanish. Well, that's uh, uh, Trump put a stop to that, and the Supreme Court backed him up. Supreme Court agreed with Trump's policy for deporting uh, illegal immigrants. Uh, uh, this crazy thing that, that that even came up. Uh, Supreme Court agreed with Trump again that immigrants remaining uh, should remain in Mexico while they're waiting their asylum decision again, rather than crossing the border into the United States. And <coughs> Supreme Court agreed with Trump. Trump again uh, that uh, Trump can restrict federal funding to sanctuary cities. Yay! Imagine that! Yeah. Goodness gracious sakes, America. Well, s sadly, we're out of time, but uh, interesting information all brought to you by the folks with the Gila County Republican Party this morning. Again, 
uh, Gary Morris and Andy McKinney with us in the studio. We thank you for tuning in and listening on Rim Country Radio, KMOG Payson, 10 o'clock, 69 degrees. Time for top of the hour news and your seven-day weather forecast.